Welcome to our series on St. Matthew's Gospel. We are contemplating uh, Matthew chapter 26, and we've been doing that for quite some time right now. And we are looking at the events of the Last Supper. Uh, we've one more shock uh, before we actually get into Gethsemane. Uh, and that is that in 2631, he said, uh, you will all lose faith in me tonight. Uh, because the scripture says, uh, the shepherd will be struck and the sheep will be scattered. So that's from Zechariah 13, 7. Um, but he said, after my resurrection, I will go before you into Galilee. But Peter has the temerity to actually contradict him. And he said, though all lose faith in you, I will never lose faith in you, Peter said. And Jesus immediately made a proclamation to him that was going to be fulfilled in a very short time. He said, this very night before the cock crows, the cock crows to announce the dawn, you will have disowned me three times. Peter absolutely holds on tenaciously to his own opinion and he says, I will never disown you. I would even die for you. That is the preparation for Gethsemane and tells you that none of them are really with him in any sense of the word. So let's look at this and take a few details that are here. What Jesus is saying is that they're all going to be scandalized. And the reason why they're going to be scandalized is that no matter what he has told them about himself, no matter how often he uh, predicted the passion and the resurrection, they kept tenaciously to their own opinion, which was that at some point he will declare himself king, he'll get a palace, he'll live in it, he'll set up a government, and he'll get an army and he'll fight Rome and we'll all be in the government. So they never got the message. So. The person they're going to meet in a very short time is the suffering servant of the Lord, predicted by Isaiah in his four servant songs, Isaiah 42, 49, 51, and 53. And the apostles were not wanting that at all, and they're going to reject it. Uh, and therefore, they are entering into temptation, is what Matthew wants you to hear. Now, a problem that they have, which is excusable, is that they have seen Jesus using divine power to walk on water, to calm the sea, to multiply bread, and all the other things that he did. They've seen that. And they cannot in any way equate that with Jesus surrendering to his enemies. That to them is a contradiction in terms. It, it doesn't work. They're not going to accept it. Um, and so what we will find is that in this event that is opening up to them, that they reject the Via Crucis. And they also reject the suffering servant of the Lord. They all reject it, it's just that Peter actually says the words. Um, if you go back to Isaiah chapter 8, verses 13 to 15, you read, it is the Lord of hosts whom you must hold in veneration. It's him you must fear. He is both the sanctuary and the stumbling stone, and he is the rock to pull people down. And by this rock, many will be brought down. Many will fall and be broken. Much, much later, when you get into the, the time of the church, St. Paul wrote in uh, chapter 9, verse 32 of his letter to the Romans, that the reason why Israel had failed was that they had stumbled over the stumbling stone. Now, St. Luke gave a prophecy uh, at the birth of Christ, which Matthew didn't pick up, that Jesus was going to be a stone of stumbling and that people were going to both fall and rise as a result of him. This is what we're going to see now. Jesus was a stumbling stone even to John the Baptist, who asked him fairly early on, are you or are you not the Messiah? I just don't get it. Then the Nazareans absolutely rejected him and wanted to kill him. And then the Pharisees and the, the Sanhedrin also rejected him and wanted to kill him. They were all pulled down by this stumbling stone, okay? And the amazing thing is that Jesus himself is the stumbling stone 
on that particular night. And Matthew uh, wants us to get a message. He doesn't write it in words. He wants you to see it between the lines. That if you personally, or you as a group, a family, a country, a church, have a wrong opinion about Jesus, it'll pull you down. We have to accept him as revealed. We cannot just have our own personal opinion about him. Let me illustrate this. I was speaking about uh, Jesus cleansing the temple once in a church and uh, a woman, I, I mentioned about Jesus being uh, having just anger in uh, setting up this stampede and cleansing the temple. And a woman really reacted to me, not immediately, but afterwards, and she said, that's not my Jesus. My Jesus is a good shepherd. And he carries the lambs in his arms. And I said, well, he just needs to know that he never was a shepherd. That's only an image. If he was anything, he was a carpenter. And then he was a, a wandering preacher. But he was never a shepherd. He never looked after physical sheep. So if you have this image lodged in your head that this is the only thing he does, which is to carry lambs in his arms or carry them on his shoulders, then you're in for one big shock. So let me give you um, a reading from uh, Isaiah chapter 55, because Isaiah was great. He warned them about everything. Seek the Lord while he is still to be found. Call to him while he is still near. Let the wicked one abandon his way and the evil one his thoughts. Let him turn back to the Lord who will have mercy on him. For my thoughts are not your thoughts and my ways are not your ways. In fact, the heavens are as high above the earth as my ways are above your ways and my thoughts above your thoughts. And immediately he goes on to say that the word of God will totally bring about that which it said, because that's what you have in Genesis at the time of creation. God said, let there be light, and there was light. God said, let us make man in our own likeness, and that's exactly what he did. And so Isaiah says, uh, as the rain and the snow come down from the heavens and do not return without watering the earth and making it yield and giving growth to provide seed for the sower and bread for the eating, so the word that goes forth from my mouth does not return to me empty. It carries out my will, exactly as it was sent to do. Now, the apostles, the whole of Israel, the Sanhedrin, everybody has enough of the words of Jesus to know exactly what he said, what he taught, what he claimed. They just didn't take it on board. But what they're going to find out as they go along in the Passion is that everything is fulfilled. If Jesus said it, it's fulfilled. If somebody else says it, it won't be fulfilled. Um, and so one of the grave mistakes that people make is to have a wrong opinion about Jesus. We've got to let the Lord show us who he is himself, okay? Now, one of the things that was happening as we speak about this text is that death was on the way. Death was on the march and death was going to engulf Jesus. But not only that, but it was going to engulf the little community that he was putting together that was going to form the church. They were all going to die that night. Simon Baryona was going to die. He would never, ever be the same again. He was going to die physically. They had to die metaphorically and spiritually. They had to die absolutely to their old way of life. Otherwise, they couldn't go on. This death and resurrection uh, thing had to happen to them all. And not only was Jesus going to die, and this little community also going to experience a death and resurrection, but the temple was going to die, and the city was going to die, and the country was going to die. The whole nation was going to die. Death was on the march, and the only one keeping vigil and praying was Jesus. All the others seemed to have been blind and deaf and dumb to what was actually going on. They were not listening uh, to the signs of the times. What's very sad for Jesus is that the apostles, the ones closest to him, his, his chosen witnesses, are not keeping vigil and they're not praying. And Jesus said he would return, but they never seemed to have heard him saying he would return. And he said, 
I will meet you in Galilee. So what is it about Galilee that Jesus said he would meet them in Galilee? And of course, the message they got after the resurrection was, I'll meet you in Galilee. If you go back to chapter four of Matthew's gospel, uh, Matthew tells you the significance of Galilee because he tells you that that's where Jesus started his ministry. That was where Jesus found his, his three great witnesses, the first four disciples, Peter, Andrew, James, and John. Okay, and it was in chapter four that he explained that the significance of Galilee was given by Isaiah in Isaiah 9.1. And he said, land of Zebulon, land of Nephtali. That was where the two tribes of Zebulon and Nephtali were settled at the time of Joshua. He said, way of the sea on the far side of the Jordan, Galilee of the nations. Galilee represented the whole mission that Jesus gave to these men to take his gospel to the ends of the earth because it was in Galilee, it was the only place in Israel where Jews and Gentiles lived happily together and worked side by side and considered themselves neighbors to each other. Galilee of the nations. So the, 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 the four first apostles that Jesus actually called were all from Galilee. So they were used to this idea of working with people from other nations. They were not having a problem with this. It was only the folks down in Jerusalem that was having a problem with it. And of course, Judas was one of them. Galilee of the nations, the people that walked in darkness have seen a great light. So the significance of Galilee was that it represented the entire mission. It was from there that the chief witnesses were chosen. Uh, and uh, Galilee was going to be the place where they would meet after the resurrection to launch the mission to the whole world. And so when Jesus said, I will meet you in Galilee, he was saying, there's something I have to do for you. And then we will launch the mission together. They didn't hear him at all. Not at all. They're in a different space. And so you get this extraordinary moment, which I can only call Peter's bravado. Um, he completely misunderstands what's going on. He's the spokesman for the whole group. Um, and so uh, because he has been elected the number one disciple, he thinks he can correct Jesus. We had that problem before in chapter 16 when he took Jesus aside and said, no, 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 we're not having suffering, do you mind? We're not having that. And then on Mount Tabor in chapter 17, he said, now you've got it. We want glory. We want success and glory and all wonderful stuff. Um, and they haven't changed their minds about that, even though Jesus has tried to help them. So here he contradicts Jesus. Uh, he doesn't appear to be aware of his own weaknesses, and he's not yet aware of the fact of something that's written in John 15, 5, where Jesus said, without me, you can do nothing. So G uh, Peter is making the classic mistake of leaning on himself, leaning on his own strength, and telling Jesus, you can rely on me. Even if all the others let you down, you can rely on me. Well, we'll see how much you can rely on him. It's just incredible. And Jesus said, uh, it is the exact opposite to what you're saying, Peter, that in a very short time, you will have disowned me three times. In the scriptures, the number three is the sacred number. It represents God. I always call it the divine signature. Uh, and to be told that you were going to deny the Lord three times is the most solemn, the most incredible thing. Peter should have said, Lord, tell me what it is that's wrong. He didn't. He said, I won't deny you. I die for you instead. So you have this absolute lack of self-knowledge. And so all the weaknesses are coming out. The cross unveils everything. And here in this one instant, the, the, the leader of the apostolic college, the one who's going to be in Jesus' shoes very soon, you see all his weaknesses. <laughs> Thank you.
one of the incredible things about the scriptures is that they're completely honest about people. They don't put a, a leader up on a pedestal as if he was some kind of a divine creature. They acknowledge the person's weaknesses. Um, so Peter doesn't realize that he's falling straight into a trap that Satan is setting for him simply because he doesn't remember that the book of Proverbs chapter 11 uh, verse 4 says pride comes before a fall. And so for Peter's own sake and for his safety in the future, Jesus is going to have to let him fall. Jesus is going to have to let him discover that he needs to lean on God and he needs to lean on grace. Uh, now, back in chapter 16, Peter had rejected suffering. He wasn't the only one, they all rejected it, uh, but he was the spokesman for them all. And here he's going to go a step further, which is really sad. He will not only reject suffering, he will reject the suffering servant of the Lord as well. He will reject Jesus as the suffering servant. He has never accepted those four servant songs of Isaiah that described Jesus as the one who would save them through suffering, not save them through glory. Uh, and he has not accepted that. Uh, so Peter's insistence uh, that Jesus can rely on him is going to sound awfully hollow very, very soon, okay? Because it's going to be matched by his vehement rejection of Jesus in public. Now, go back to chapter 16, and there was two extraordinary moments in it between Peter and Jesus. One was the recognition between the two of them. You are the Christ, the Son of God. You are my Peter. And then very soon afterwards, I won't have you suffering. Get behind me. And so we have another one of these terrible crises between the two of them again and it's going to cost Jesus a lot of pain. Now, Matthew won't deal with the pain side of it. Uh, he'll just deal with the facts, okay? Uh, because it's the suffering servant of the Lord that he has to accept. And he has to accept that the kingdom that Jesus is putting together is a spiritual kingdom. It's not a political situation. And the problem is they've never accepted that. Jesus has tried very hard uh, to put it across to them. Um, so Jesus is going in to Gethsemane and he's going in alone. The very first apostle to fall will be Peter. Well, not really, it was Judas, but of the ones that are left, the ones who are going to go on with him, the first one to fall is Peter. And this is going to be a very uh, pivotal moment for them all. So we come to uh, Gethsemane and the trial begins. The trial begins instantly. Uh, Jesus goes into prayer, the others don't. And how you deal with the trial tells heaven, earth and hell who you are. Okay, so this is what Matthew says. They then came to a small estate called Gethsemane. Ah, Gethsemane was an oil press and a friend of Jesus owned this estate. We know it was Lazarus. Uh, and because he wanted to show his love for Jesus, he allowed the poor uh, to use his oil press for free. If they went anywhere else, they'd have to pray for the, the use of an oil press. And so he allowed them to crush their grapes and to crush their olives free of charge in his gardens, in his estate. Uh, and it was to that place that Jesus went because the crushing of the olives and the grapes were very symbolic of what was going to happen to him personally. Isaiah 63 verse 3 says, I have trodden the winepress alone. Of the men of my people, not one was with me. And that was exactly what happened to Jesus. He, he didn't have his 12. Judas is gone. He doesn't really have the 11, and he certainly doesn't have his three special witnesses. None of them are really with him at all, which is really sad. And Matthew uh, tells us that Jesus left the bulk of the disciples uh, just inside the garden, 
And then he took the three main witnesses and he went into the depths of the garden with them. And he moved slightly further than them in order to go and pray. Now, why are you given that detail? There's nothing in the scriptures given to you uh, for no reason. Uh, if you know your scriptures, you will remember to go back to Genesis chapter 22. And back in Genesis 22, uh, Abraham has been challenged by God to make the supreme sacrifice to God. And the supreme sacrifice is that you will offer God everything that is of value to you everything. And as far as Abraham was concerned, everything was in his son. His future, the fulfillment of God's promises, everything was in his son. So if he wanted to make one gesture that would say to God, as you read in Deuteronomy 6, 4 to 10, that I love you with my whole heart, my whole soul, my whole mind, and my whole being, then I offer this son to you. He is everything. He's my heart, he's my soul, he's my future, he's the meaning of my life, he's absolutely everything. And so that's the meaning of the gesture of offering Isaac. Now, I'm not going into detail about that story. Isaac, of course, had to agree, otherwise it would be murder. And so what you're told back in Genesis is that when they set out on the journey to Mount Moriah, which is only about a third of a mile as we in Ireland say, as the crow flies to Calvary, a very short distance, Mount Moriah to Calvary. And it was there on the great stone of sacrifice, which you will find today under the uh, Dome of the Rock. It's one of the reasons why Muslims and Jews fight for that particular site, because it's very sacred to both. Um, and it was on this rock and Calvary is only a very short distance away, uh, that Abraham made the supreme sacrifice to God. Now, God did not uh, want the death sentence for Isaac, but the, the offering was sufficient. And once you make the offering, God accepts it as if the sacrifice has actually happened. And what you find is that they left their servants further back and only Abraham and Isaac went forward because this was a father-son mystery. And when they came to this rock, there was only the father and the son. By the time Jesus gets to the rock of agony, there's only the father and the son. The bulk of the apostles have been left uh, behind. The three witnesses are nearer, but they're not really with Jesus. And Jesus is alone with his father and the mystery takes place completely between the Father and the Son. Now, the whole of the passion and death and resurrection of Jesus is a Father-Son mystery. And if we begin to grasp that, uh, we will look upon the passion of Jesus differently. For example, in John's Gospel, Jesus said, to see me is to see the Father. The Father and I are one. And so, if you hold on to, to that and start looking at the detail of the passion, it will be very different to what you're actually expecting. Okay, so Jesus goes into Gethsemane and this is the place where you're going to be surprised at me saying this, everything happens. The whole battle takes place here and the victory is in Gethsemane as well. I hope you'll come back to hear that. Thank you for listening. Sláin agus bánach day live. Goodbye. God bless you. The work of Shalom is an essential part and a powerful part of the work of evangelization, of promoting the objective of sharing the good news of the gospel, the joy of the good news of the gospel and its promise of salvation in this life and beyond death in the new life of the risen Lord. Its evangelization of culture and civilization is a most important objective for the people of God and the church right around the world. In this 21st century, when the human family is battered by so many forces of change, of uncertainty, forces which seem to threaten and menace hope. 
the hope of the risen Christ and of the good news of the gospel is something which has to be shared not only between individuals but with communities of peoples right around the nations of God's earth. May the Lord bestow his blessing on the work of Shalom, on all who are, so who are associated with it, and also indeed on all those who through their charity and kindness support its most important work. <laughs> <laughs>